Wednesday morning to you. Today is Wednesday, September the 1st. So we are now officially in the last quarter of 2021. Can you believe it? Um, in some ways, it seems like this year has just drawn slowly by, but in other ways, it's uh, just passed us by quickly. And so uh, coming into the fall season, and I'm looking forward to fall. I love this time of the year just a couple of weeks when the beliefs begin to change and everything begins to go dormant. And the exciting thing about fall, I think, is you you have that season where everything's so pretty and then the winter comes. And fortunately here in Georgia, the winters are short. And then we have the spring to look forward to. And it's always uh, just a recognition of, of the cycle of life, if you will. Uh, so anyway, I want to remind you that tonight is corporate prayer, 6.30 p.m. It will be in the music suite, and so I encourage you to be a part of that. Uh, join together. Um, have, have a series beginning the middle of September where we're going to have an emphasis on, on sowing, uh, cultivating, and harvesting. We might call that a series on evangelism, but pray with me, those who are prayers, that God will work in our hearts and we'll see our hearts move to the to the mission of winning people to Christ. And so um, that's coming up beginning uh, the second Sunday of September. This weekend is uh, Labor Day. And so if you have plans this weekend, I pray the Lord will give you safety. Continue to remember to pray for Jay and Morgan and Shannon and Ruby as uh, they're still grieving the loss of Donna and we are grieving along with them. Pray for Vanessa as she starts her chemotherapy treatment. Uh, pray especially for her, um, just for her mind, peace of mind, peace of heart uh, in the midst of this, and continue to pray for the Petresca family. Um, Constantine is going back to Augusta, I think, this weekend for some more tests, and so praying for that transfusion to be able to take place. And there's so many other prayer requests in the body, um, but uh, just just pray for the body and keep in touch with the body. If you're uh, taking precautions during this upswing in COVID and you're not gathering together physically, stay in contact with each other. Um, it's so important. That's why we are blessed to have small groups or Sunday school classes, those places where we assemble together with smaller believers to care for each other. So encourage one another. There it is a fountain
I saw the stream I flowing will supply Redeeming love shall be my theme. Redeeming love. Redeeming love shall be my theme. Think about that for a minute. <clears throat> his, his love, because of his love, he has redeemed us. He's purchased us. We were once uh, enslaved, owned by sin, Satan, but because of his love, he paid the price. He, he shed his blood so that we might be purchased. Purchased and brought out of the slave market and set free in Christ. That is a great thing, man. That should be the theme until the day we die. We're picking up in where we left off yesterday in verse 16 of John chapter 4 where Jesus is having this discourse with the Samaritan woman where he meets her at the well. And... Um, he had expressed to her that the water that he might give will, will cause her or any of us to never thirst again. And we saw yesterday that um, um, he had told her to go, go find your husband. She says, I have no husband. He says, yeah, I know you, you've, got, you've, had, <laughs> you've had five and the one you're with now is not your husband. And, and we recognize that, that apart from a relationship and fellowship with God that we'll do everything we can to try to fill that God void that we have, that, that place that, uh, that only he can satisfy us. And uh, that living water, of course, is a satisfaction. So picking up in verse 16 to repeat this, he, he says, uh, go call your husband. The woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband for you've had five husbands. And the one that you're now with is not your husband. And the woman said, verse 19, she begins to kind of turn the conversation. None of us want to deal with our sin, do we? When, when uh, either at, at that initiation, when he is saving us, uh, we don't want to recognize and repent from our sins. And also as believers, we, 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 we don't like light being shown on our sin because it necessitates us to, to turn, to repent from that, and to trust the Lord. And so she turns the tables and, and begins to kind of take it to a theological slant rather than dealing with her sin. I found through the years that oftentimes Christians, rather than wanting to deal or talk, with, talk about what God might be doing in their heart personally, how he might be growing them, and refining them and renewing them, conforming them to the likeness of Christ, they rarely have conversation that they can engage in in that. And uh, they like to turn the conversation to theology or doctrine. Now, theology and doctrine are very important, extremely important. And they're great to meditate on, but all of our theology and all of our doctrines should lead us into a closer fellowship with God, uh, because his greatest work in us is to conform us to the likeness of Christ by the work of the Holy Spirit through the word of God. So here she turns the conversation and she says, our fathers worshiped on this mountain, that mountain there in, 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 in the Northern area where 
um, they had built a temple to another god, if you will. They had rejected the god of Israel. Remember, we said that Samaritans were half Jews, mixed Assyrians. And they created and formed their own religion, if you will, and they built a temple there. And she said, our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Now here we have a couple of things. She, she's going to be dealing with worship. And, and worship is, is merely giving honor to God. We can take that word worship and call it worth-ship. Now take out of your mind for a moment what we do on Sunday mornings in the sanctuary. We call that worship. But can I, can I say that's only a small part? I mean, that is just, that's really just an expression of our honor to God. Uh, because all of life really is worship. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. But she speaks of the place. Uh, we like to say we go to church to worship, uh, but that's not a full understanding of what worship really is. Yes, we go and assemble with the saints in a place that we call the church, but really the, the church is the gathering of the saints, that ecclesia, that the body of Christ comes together in a building or a place to worship together, to have a worship service. Um, and so she was making the point, the argument, where's the place that we're to worship? And Jesus tells her this, woman, believe me. In other words, woman, mark it down, write it down. There's coming a time, uh, there's an hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem where you worship the Father. Now, Jerusalem and the temple in Jerusalem was sacred to the Jew. Why? Because that was the carryover from the tabernacle where God had instructed Moses to build the tabernacle in the wilderness. Then the first temple was built. That temple was destroyed. The temple was rebuilt. And here now we have Herod's temple uh, there in Jerusalem. Um, uh, and um, so... It was that place where the Holy of Holies was, where God met the children of Israel. We could see the practice of that worship and how that was to take place through the book of Leviticus. And so that was the place where Jews came to worship God. And so it was very sacred. Now Jesus is saying something very profound here. That and to the Jew, this was probably very offensive. That, that we'll neither worship the Father on this mountain where you are in Samaria, nor will we worship the Father in Jerusalem. Oh my goodness, that was a, in, in, in Jesus' day, for him to make that statement, as a matter of fact, that statement that he would make later, tear this temple down in three days I will rebuild it, was part of what led the Jews to, to, to desire him to be crucified, to be killed. It was a blasphemous thing. But Jesus is making a point that, that the place of worship is not what is important. You and I can worship the Lord anywhere we are. We are to worship him wherever we are. Worship, because he's worthy of our honor, he's worthy of our homage, he's worthy of all that we are. Paul said that whether we eat or we drink, whatever we do, do it unto the Lord that we're to worship God through whatever it is that we might do. I, I, I think about my day during the day. If, if, if I'm at work, that is a part of worship, where you work, how you work, your attitude in that. That is a reflection of worship to God. Where you play, that is a reflection of your worship to God. Uh, where how you interact with your family that is a, a means of worship to God um, w where where you might find your leisure if you're out like I, I love being in the yard and working in my garden with my plants that can be an act of worship whatever we do whether we eat or drink do all unto the Lord so worship is not just confined to that expression on Sunday mornings but the Bible, as we carry it through and all of the understanding of what worship is, worship is our whole lives, everything that we are, given over to God, honor Him in obedience to that. And he goes on to say in verse 22, you worship what you do not know, we worship what we know. 
for salvation is from the Jews. Now, he just kind of settles the issue there. Just kind of says, listen, you're, you're worshiping what you don't know. You're worshiping a God that doesn't even exist. But we worship the true God. For salvation is from the Jews. Now, Jesus was making an allusion uh, to him, the Messiah, that God would send salvation not only for the Jew, but also for the Gentile. And it would come through God's chosen, redeemed people, the Jew. And so he just kind of settles the issue there. He said, but the hour is coming, verse 23, uh, and is now here when true worshipers, those who have, have worship truly, who are sincere worshipers. I think of when Jesus said to the Pharisees, you worship me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. You see, take for instance, our Sunday morning gatherings, wherever you might gather in Sunday morning worship. We can, we can move our lips and we can sing the songs or not sing the songs, which is the case a lot of times. But, but if we only move our lips and our hearts are far from him, it is just empty words. I don't care what song you sing. I don't care if it's one of the most sacred hymns of old or if it's one of the, the, the new modern hymns. Regardless of what we sing, if our heart is not there, then it's not worship to God. It is just noise, really. It may sound good to you, it may sound good to others, but it means nothing. You see, God desires, though, who will worship him in truth, in spirit and in truth, he goes on to say. He said, true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Two things here. Now, this is the how of worship. In spirit meaning with our inner being, with our inner man, not with our flesh. You see, the flesh can't worship God. And, and I've seen fleshly worship in, in all manners of genre of what we call worship. And it's flesh. Flesh produces nothing but flesh. But it's with our spirits that we commune with God. So he says, true worshipers, the Father seeking those who will be true worshipers, who will worship him in spirit, and in truth, where it's, it, it's founded and grounded on what, what the Word of God says, which is absolute truth. And the other point of that is that it is true worship. In other words, it's real and it's sincere. It rings true, okay? So the Father is looking for those who will worship. The Father is seeking people to worship Him. I love what John Piper said one time. He said that missions exist because worship doesn't. Think about that. What, now, what is missions? Missions is evangelism and discipleship. That's what missions are. We've done missions a disservice by, by, by placing missions as an emphasis on foreign missions, but, but we're called to be missionaries wherever we are. We're, we're on mission, whether it's here or in a foreign land. And missions is evangelism, sharing the gospel, and discipling, teaching those to obey all that Jesus had commanded. That's discipleship. And so um, in, in this sense where, where he says that, uh, that uh, God is seeking those who worship him in spirit, and we must worship him in spirit and in truth. The Father is seeking those to worship him. Back to John Piper's statement that missions exist because worship doesn't. You see, the whole point of mission, the whole point of evangelism and discipleship is to bring those into the kingdom so that they might worship God. That, that they're saved and in that now we worship him. The unbeliever, the unregenerate person, the person who's not been born again cannot worship God. And so here he says that, um, that, that we're to worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, verse 25, wrapping it up. And the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Now, here she recognized that Messiah is coming. And her eyes are beginning to open here. Notice 
the three instances that she begins to recognize you. First, she recognizes earlier in the passage that he's a Jew. Then she recognizes that he's a prophet, which he was. Now she's beginning to recognize that he's Messiah. What I want to point out here is, is there is that cultivation in a person's heart where the seed is planted and now her eyes and her heart are beginning to be open to the Messiah. Pray today that God would give you and me opportunity that wherever we are, whether it be in the grocery store, whether it be at work, whether it be at home, wherever we are, that we would be open to the Spirit's leading and we would take initiative and be intentional to either plant a seed of the gospel in somebody's heart to cultivate a seed that may have already been planted there. And if God would so grace us to be able to witness him, save someone, and we'd be a part of witnessing the harvest. Pray that God would give us that opportunity. I love you. I pray the Lord's blessings on you, that he keep you.